Good evening, everyone uh, from the west coast of Ireland and, of course, to Zoe in the Lake District, but to all of you wherever you are. Um, this is the third in our series of summer webinars, and uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Zoe Wilson from ZW Clinics. And uh, a real treat to have you as the, the third in the trio. So Dr. Tim Kilmartin, Dr. Doug Ritchie and Zoe Wilson. So um, Zoe uh, qualified in 2015 from the Salford School of uh, Podiatric Medicine. Uh, subsequent to that, she did her master's degree in uh, theory of podiatric surgery. In uh, 2017, she set up her first clinic in the Lake District, um, ZW Clinics, as I mentioned. And in 2021, she set up her second clinic. Um, for those that don't know her, she's incredibly enthusiastic, very passionate, and uh, has really built a significant clinical practice treating complex with ankle pathologies. And uh, she really pushes the boundaries in terms of uh, rehabilitation therapy, specifically using uh, ankle foot orthoses, and in this case, Richie Brace therapy. Um, also does a lot of work with podiatric surgeons and is really one of the leading lights in our profession. So uh, without further ado, as they say, a big welcome to uh, Zoe Wilson. Hello everyone, thank you for joining and thank you guys for having me and uh, asking me to be part of this uh, amazing series, uh, not tough acts to follow at all, uh, with Doug Ritchie and um, Dr. Tim Kilmartin. Um, very much enjoyed their webinars and I hope that this brings you um, an insight into how we manage foot drop in the podiatric setting. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay, so thank you all very much uh, for joining me on this really exciting journey that we're going to take this evening on management of bilateral foot drop secondary to spinal pathology, uh, and that's utilising the Ritchie Brace. Um, I've been using the Ritchie Brace for around three to four years now, and it really has been transformative for my patients and also um, for me as a clinician. And um, this journey we're going to take this evening is a little bit kind of um, off my off piece, shall we say, um, from my usual approach, because what I'm going to do this evening is actually put us in the shoes of the patient. And obviously we're gonna do the, the boring bits first, um, although hopefully I can um, you know, excite you with uh, my interest in this pathology. Um, so this is our patient actually in the middle, his name is Mike, and you're gonna be hearing from Mike uh, during this presentation. So a little bit about me, um, for those of you that don't know, um, my name's Zoe, I'm a podiatrist based in the Lake District. Um, my clinic is actually based in Kirby Lonsdale, which is a little bit closer to um, Yorkshire. And uh, we're a, a multidisciplinary practice. We've got podiatrists, foot and ankle surgeons, um, uh, physiotherapists, and we're kind of onboarding new people all the time. And I think what's really interesting about these types of cases is we really, um, you know, we, we really appreciate um, the multidisciplinary approach and as do the patients and the results show for themselves when we incorporate that. So a little bit about the lecture overview. So we're gonna talk obviously about the anatomical considerations um, and how that impacts the biomechanics and what we're looking for in terms of that gait cycle and the key components of the gait cycle more importantly, with regards to this condition. Etiological factors, there are many. And I think what's really important, and I know we always talk about it, but it's the history and taking a very thorough history, um, as well as a, a thorough clinical exam, um, and also um, appreciating further investigations when they're required and, and for what reasons we request them. Um, some of the management strategies that are already out there, a little bit around the Ritchie Brace. And then, of course, we're going to dive into the case presentation. So relevant anatomy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about basically the focal lesions that we look at when it comes to um, 
peripheral um, neurological conditions, which is most of the patients that we're going to see that present with foot drop. So in terms of those two focal areas, we know that it, you know, there's involvement from the sciatic nerve root at the level of L5 and also the common perineal nerve and whether or not along that kind of um, course of the nerve, whether it's um, the root at the, at the sciatic foramen or it is indeed um, more localized at the level of the fibula head where that common perineal nerve wraps around the fibula. Um, we're going to talk about obviously the primary dorsal flexors of the ankle, that being TIBAN, EDL and EHL. We're going to talk about proximal weakness um, and how that, you know, has a role in terms of how we manage these patients. Equinovirus um, and gastroc equinus, unfortunately, in lots of these patients, we're going to see a gastroc equinus. Um, and that's because of the antagonist role of the gastroxyleus complex in regards to the anterior um, compartment of the leg um, and the compensatory patterns that we see as a result of that loss in dorsiflexion. I don't really think we appreciate dorsiflexion and certainly our patients don't, uh, don't until it is lost. So in terms of the biomechanics, we're going to talk about heel strike, mid stance and propulsion um, and really in terms of what phases of the gait cycle, those muscle groups that are innovated by um, that nerve deficit that, you know, um, have an impact. So as we've discussed, tibialis anterior, um, extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus are primary dorsiflexors at the level of the ankle. So at heel strike, um, just kind of prior to heel strike in that swing phase, that is when we're going to be seeing concentric contraction of those ankle dorsiflexors. And then in the loading response, when that foot um, becomes kind of foot flat in the gait cycle, we're talking about that eccentric load of the uh, dorsiflexors as well. And then, um, of course, propulsion. And we know in some cases of foot drop that propulsion can also be lost. So etiology and history is primarily, you know, it's the most important aspect of um, where is this foot drop arising from? What do we need to question in that history um, as to where this could have come from? So in terms of compression, um, we know that crossing the legs actually has been well reported within the literature to be a factor um, of uh, presenting cases of foot drop. Um, and because that common perineal nerve is so superficial at the level of the fibula neck, um, we know that the compressibility of that area um, can be quite easy. Lumbar radiculopathy and spondylitis, so uh, and lumbar disc herniation, we know at the level of uh, L5 that we can get compression um, more at the nerve root in the lower back. 10% um, of cases actually occur following um, intensive care unit. Um, period. So if a patient um, has been uh, lying in, in, in bed rest, we know that 10% of cases in the literature actually point towards uh, foot drop. And of course, unfortunately, metastatic disease and compressibility around the fibula. So um, you may look at metastatic uh, lesions within the fibula itself, um, unfortunately causing compression over that area. Traumatic, so these are a little bit rarer in terms of what comes in, but it does happen. And certainly in the Lake District, there's lots of people with farms and cows um, and large animals uh, whereby these uh, traumas can take place. So patella dislocation, um, which may be seen in, in uh, the hypermobility population. Um, total knee replacement, uh, there is some reports of uh, foot drop following total knee replacement and that's just in relation sometimes to post-op swelling um, or unf unfortunate um, nerve damage um, at the surgical site. Um, sciatic neuropathy, fractures of the fibula neck which are quite rare and again it's usually direct trauma to that fibula neck. Neurological causes, so shark and marry tooth and other acquired peripheral neuropathies, um, multiple sclerosis, uh, in some cases of stroke, and we're going to talk about actually how stroke is managed, um, you know, when foot drop is, is a part of that presentation. Guillain-Barr syndrome, um, mononeuritis um, multiplex, which can be seen in AIDS, hepatitis, hepatitis 
um, and motor neurons disease. So in terms of what we've already discussed, I just thought I'd put this little um, kind of uh, image here of looking at the uh, perineal nerve as it passes around the fibula head. So we know that the perineal nerve is a um, branch of the sciatic nerve. And generally with these patients, they can get lateral leg uh, paresthesia in the early stages. And you may see that um, continue to the dorsum of the foot. And if the deep perineal nerve is affected, the first and second toe cleft. Um, so obviously on the left side here, we can kind of see normal function. Um, the foot is in dorsiflexion at heel strike. Um, the patient is then able to load the foot uh, and push off as normal. And unfortunately, when we've got a deficit or compression or a trauma or whatever the reason is, um, that um, ability to raise the foot is lost. And so, um, and thus ground clearance is compromised. So in lots of these patients, um, we, we do tend to find that they can have trips and falls um, and there's a history of that frustration surrounding the quality of life. So we've kind of already discussed, but these are kind of the focal liege locations. So this is talking about um, the, the primary presentations that we're going to see. So as mentioned, the L5 sciatic nerve root in the lower spine, um, and also, I'm just gonna move that little box out of the way, I can't see. Um, and then localized as mentioned in the, the common perineal nerve. So during the clinical assessment, the gait assessment is where you're gonna see everything with these patients. But it's also important to consider your neurological assessment and your findings. And in some cases where it's not an isolated or focal lesion, and it's a, it's a, a broader issue in terms of that patient's history, then you're going to get more positivity in terms of um, some of the testing that we look at, reflexes, um, Babinski sign, and um, you know, various other neurological tests that we look at. So what I'm looking at in a gait assessment is the steppage gait. So it's the high stepping gait that we see. And that's because the patient is unable to achieve ground clearance. And so we see them kind of hitching up at the hip, lifting the knee because they're not able to get that clearance through the swing phase of gait. Often when these patients come in, you hear them before they enter your treatment room. So they'll be walking in from the waiting room and you hear the foot slapping on the floor, okay? And that is something you know, that you sometimes see. Um, and in cases much like we're gonna discuss today, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, assessment of the pe of pelvic stability is really important. Um, often you'll find, as mentioned, that these patients will have compensatory patterns, um, that being through the pelvic um, and kind of this trunk leaning gait um, and, and circumduction. And it's all just to achieve ground clearance so they don't trip over. Um, hyperextension can be seen at the level of the knee um, as well in some cases. And these are patients that generally um, I may refer on for different types of AFO therapy, um, that being like a, a back slab style AFO. So clinical assessment, things that you can do in clinic, these are things that we do every day anyway. But ankle range of motion is really important. Um, as we've mentioned, due to the deficits in the anterior compartment, you can see contraction in that posterior compartment. Um, so silver skull test. So many of you may already perform this in clinic, but in patients with foot drop, you'll often find that it's quite difficult with the leg straight to get them beyond 90 degrees. Um, if you catch them earlier, um, that contraction is going to be less involved, but often we don't get them early enough. They're coming to us, unfortunately, when they've had um, involvement from a range of different professionals or they've used over-the-counter devices and it's not really kind of helped. So we do see them where they're more involved. And we're going to talk a little bit about the hinge types today because it's really important to consider um, selection of your hinge when looking at range of movement due to that contracture or trauma um, if you're really unlucky. Strength testing, of course, um, I get these patients um, on the couch looking at, obviously dorsiflexion um, is one of those where you, you're not, you sometimes forget, like they'll come in for a follow-up and you'll be like, oh, could you dorsiflex your foot? And then you forget. 
Um, so, you know, a lot of the time, if you feel that um, they've got some involvement of foot drop, which you'll, you, then you will hear more of a foot slap. Um, because they might have some function, but over time that fatigues. So there are different levels of foot drop. So we've got kind of partially involved and, 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 and you know, kind of more um, advanced cases of this as well. Um, it's unilateral in 90% of cases. If it's bilateral, again, we need to question the systemic um, conditions that, that may relate to that. Foot posture index, how does that foot look? relative to the supporting service, surface. So is the forefoot, um, you'd have to look at this non-weight bearing, but is the forefoot inverted? And have they got a reducible inverted forefoot? That being supinatus, reducible, can you bring that first met down? Or have they got a fixed deformity, that being varus? Just because they have foot drop does not, not mean that they're not gonna have foot posture issues as well. And the patient that we're going to talk about today certainly had both of those, unfortunately. Um, power in propulsion. So I'll often look at a uh, single leg heel raise, uh, which can be reduced. And in the case we're looking at today, that certainly was the case. An MSK screen of the lower limb, really important. So just looking at all those muscle groups. So further investigations are often warranted. And what you will often find is that these patients have already had um, some form of investigation, because remember, a lot of the time they're not coming to you um, as, as first contact. It's usually that they've been a few places and they're coming to us later on. And that's certainly what I find. Family history, really important. When you start to delve into the family history of these patients, there might be MS in the family. There might be these systemic conditions, unfortunately, um, in all different forms. And there are many different neurological forms um, of conditions that can affect the periphery. Um, imaging, um, so obviously um, this doesn't lie with us, but contrast MRI and CT may be used, um, that being of the brain. So, so looking for lesions um, in the brain and kind of around the, uh, the spine. Um, nerve conduction studies, obviously we know about um, nerve conduction studies in relation to how that nerve is functioning along its course. How is it reacting to a stimulus? And this gives us um, a confirmation. You know, we, we kind of know by chatting to patients what nerve may be working and what may not, depending on dermatomes, myotomes, and some of those assessments that we look at when they first come in. But nerve conduction studies, um, if the patient hasn't had any, I would always order these. Um, and, and obviously further down the line, muscle and nerve biopsies may also be performed. So management and, and MDT working with these patients is really important. And um, from a surgical standpoint, nerve transection, reconstruction, decompression, uh, discectomy, as we know, and craniotomies, you know, um, certainly in those more advanced uh, cases that, that don't tend to stay with us. Um, conservative therapy, um, of course, physiotherapy. I always involve um, physiotherapy. I actually do joint assessments at my clinic now. So for all of my foot drop patients, they get a joint multidisciplinary team assessment from the get go because we cannot do our jobs, um, you know, to the extent and get the results and the outcomes that we want for these patients without that support. Um, and, and my colleagues that I work with will, will echo that, I'm sure, that are already prescribing the brace for foot drop. Pharmacological um, interventions, that being things like gabapentin, if there's, um, or amitriptyline, if there's um, nerve related um, pain um, involved with, with the periphery. Uh, AFO therapy, or proximal AFO therapy, of course, which we're going to talk about today. Functional electrical stimulation. Has anyone heard of FES? So FES, essentially, if you were looking at it on a patient, it is a box that sits kind of around the, actually just below the knee. Um, and it's basically attached to those anterior components, um, that being Tiban and, and the other muscle groups that we talked about. And it sends an electrical impulse to that muscle um, and, and gets that muscle to kind of activate. So for stroke patients, you do see FES therapy 
uh, used quite a lot, but it is quite expensive. It can be funded on the NHS, but they, they kind of have had to go through quite a long process in order for that to happen. As we've talked about, um, it's also reducing that development of gastroxylius contracture. Um, and I think that's you know, one of our primary roles um, from, the re from a rehabilitation point of view. So in that MDT, as discussed, podiatrist, yes, neurologist, absolutely, physiotherapy, absolutely, and of course, communicating with the GP throughout this process. So um, this is me um, doing a Ritchie brace uh, plaster Paris cast. So for some of you that may be on the webinar this evening, um, I ran my first cohort course on uh, an introduction to prescribing the Ritchie brace in February. Um, so alongside driving some nice vehicles, um, we had two days of intense education on assessment management and a practical session on casting for the Ritchie brace. So if you go on Firefly's website, there's actually a really good video of Martin showing you this exact technique. Um, and don't get me wrong, it, it takes practice, it takes time. The first time I casted one of these, um, it was on a family friend, luckily, for a Tamarack hinge, uh, Richie Brace for foot drop. And I had to cast him like four or five times um, because I wasn't happy with the position. And it takes time. And like anything, it's just applying that skill um, and, and repetition. So the specifications in terms of what we're looking at. Brace type pathology, posting shell modification, very similar to orthosis. Hinge type, really important. If you've got somebody with a foot drop that's been diagnosed later on, or they've got some form of um, potential ankle OA, um, which obviously the brace can be used for as well. But if you've got somebody that can't go beyond 90 degrees, um, that Tamarack hinge is going to fatigue um, and so it's, it, it is worth considering when you're looking at these patients. And if you can get them to 90 degrees and you put them in a fixed brace, 90 degrees is a really nice place for these patients to be, you know, because really um, they've not been able to achieve even a plantar grade position. And if we can get 90 degrees in the swing phase and that's as far as we can go, um, you know, it, it's for these patients, as you'll, as you'll see from my case study, that it works really well. And I was really nervous about using fixed hinge because I was like, why would we fix the ankle? Um, but it's very stable, extremely stable. And, and these patients crave that. So closing points on this presentation, differential diagnosis is really important. You want these patients to be coming in with reels and reels of paper with you know, clinical letters, investigations, um, you know, I'm always very grateful that I've got more information, but sometimes it's also our job to arrange those further investigations. Um, and certainly if we've got time today, um, we can have a discussion regarding um, what I would request and why. Um, as mentioned, the MDT is the gold standard. And if you want to come and shadow, then please um, contact me. So the exciting part, I hope you're all still awake. Uh, this is the case presentation. So this is lovely Mike in the middle. Uh, and he sent me this, I think about two weeks um, after having his brace fitted. Um, what you can see is that he's actually got a couple of dressings on his legs. Cause basically he got his braces. He didn't follow my advice and get long socks. And he just went and did like a five mile walk. And as we know with patients, you know, certainly when they're very passionate about the intervention they may well just, just kind of crack on and, and go. Um, but here they are, two of them wearing hokers. And uh, he sent me this and said, you've made three men very happy today because this is the first time Mike had played tennis in about three years. Um, so that was lovely. So Mike is a 74 year old male consultant psychiatrist. He presented with bilateral foot drop. I have gained consent from Mike. He may well be watching. He'll certainly watch the um, recording, but I have gained consent and he's very happy for me to share this. Um, so he presented with bilateral foot drop, difficulty ambulating, balance related issues, frustration with day to day activities. He's an avid Man City fan. Um, and so going to a football game and standing for periods of time 
celebrating when a goal is scored um, was quite difficult for him. And he was quite open about the fact that his quality of life was significantly impacted by his lack of mobility. So Mike developed severe back pain 35 years ago following work in Sierra Leone. Um, and it manifested as left-sided sciatica. He was um, put in traction for a week um, in hospital. Um, and further investigations were not offered at this time. And he, uh, it then manifested as left-sided um, paresthesia in the lateral lower leg. And the weakness kind of emerged over a period of time. So it was a progressive weakness. Um, and what he noticed, or his wife actually noticed, was that he was losing muscle mass in his left uh, gastro region. Um, and certainly when you're looking at these patients in terms of clinical assessment, um, it's sometimes, um, you know, it, it's a huge factor in terms of your clinical assessment, should I say, just to look and even measure um, muscle atrophy. Um, so 14 years ago, he then developed right-sided sciatica. He was unable to move his big toes and the MRI confirmed changes in his spine. He was assessed by a consultant spinal surgeon um, and his treatment options were discussed, um, of which he decided to um, continue. So when he came in, um, he did have a structural leg length discrepancy affecting the right side, which you'll see on the video in a minute. Um, so that measured at around the centimeter. And we know in terms of the literature, or some of the literature looks at leg length discrepancy, saying that unless it's over 20 millimeters, we wouldn't necessarily do anything. But for these patients, it's quite, that's quite a big difference because not only has he got deficits in a major muscle group, but he's also got contralateral shifting um, as a result of this structural leg length discrepancy, um, which was um, again looked at with the physio that I worked with. Weakness of uh, at the level of glute med bilaterally, so his stability um, was affected. His overall lower limb weakness um, due to uh, compensatory patterns and, and that lack of function through the dorsiflexors. Um, Mike also has an inability to um, gain adequate propulsion as well. And so when he came to see me, he was using Hoka footwear to assist. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Hoka and the different types, because not all types can be used for these patients. Um, and if you're trying to achieve stability, um, there are certain shoes that you would completely avoid. Um, and there are shoes that, that I would select. And, and that would be the only shoe that I would select from the Hoka range for these patients. And um, what I will mention as well is Mike's got Cavus a cavus foot type, which you will see. Um, and as a result of the deficit on the left side, um, he developed more of a, a varus calc position uh, relative to the supporting surface. Um, so this was significantly affecting his ability to keep a trainer functioning for longer than a couple of months without that lateral um, EVA compressing or the EVA compressing laterally. You have weakness, of course, in dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and eversion um, bilaterally, but it was more marked on that left side. There's some sensory loss um, affecting his left side um, and some sensory deficits in the right, but primarily the left. Loss of balance was observed, the steppage gait, reduced arm swing, which we'll see, and um, four-foot plantar-grade stripe pattern. So this is Mike here. So what I want you to look at is how he's using his arms. And this is usually the first place that I kind of look when I'm assessing these patients. Um, uh, and what you can see in terms of his strike, he certainly doesn't have a heel strike. He doesn't have a four foot strike. Um, he, he does when he kind of turns and changes direction, but he actually has more of a, just a plantar grade strike. So the whole foot is just striking the floor. All right, we'll just, oop. I'll just play that again. So look at the arms. Look at that kind of right foot um, that is abducted away from his body as well. And then it's that plantar grade strike. And just that lack of confidence. Can you also see his high stepping gait? So let's just go back. So looking at his high stepping gait, he's kind of really having to lift that right hip. 
to, get, to gain that crack ground clearance. And Mike, somebody who um, actively works, um, I think he works pretty much full time still. Um, and so a lot of his day to day life, um, seeing clients and, you know, is restricted and significantly slowed down. I mean, one of the frustrations for Mike is that he can't get to, you know, he can't walk anywhere with any haste. Um, and he actually said to me that he timed a walk um, with his new braces and he was nine minutes faster uh, with his braces. So really important for a, you know, a competitive sportsman as well. So what did we do? Um, step one, as mentioned, we casted the patient for two Ritchie braces with a fixed hinge. And this is the prescription form to the right of the screen. Um, so these are your device types down the left. You may uh, wish to look at the guide below that, which talks about different conditions and how that can assist you. Certainly when you've never prescribed one of these braces before, this can be really helpful to look at. In terms of Mike, because of his cavus foot type, the cast dressing is really important. So what we didn't want to do is sit that device too close to his medial longitudinal arch and actually assist in that inverted uh, calc position. So what we did with this cast dressing is we used, um, I think it was either min or, or moderate. So that means that in terms of the cast dressing, the device just sits a little bit further away from their foot. Um, and obviously with any device, when it's casted, um, it's casted kind of foot to skin. And so there are different selections in terms of how much control you may wish to achieve. Now, if I was looking at a patient with pes planus foot type and foot drop, and believe me, they do come in probably, well, more commonly actually than, than cavoid feet, um, we might look at a type one. Um, so obviously rehabilitation, we got started as frustrating as it was for Mike, we got started on inversion eversion. Um, he did have movement in inversion eversion, but it was just reduced. So we started his rehabilitation from the very basics of isometric loading. Um, so that's neither lengthening or shortening the muscle. So just innovating the activity, stimulating that muscle group to, act, to accept load. So inversion eversion, we kind of worked on. Education on footwear. Um, and obviously the use of the brace, the wearing in process of the brace, um, the consent process. So we do consent forms um, in length for these patients. And we talk about all possible um, eventualities as well as onward referral. And of course, physio referral was, um, was arranged. So this is him with his fixed brace, his hoka shoes, um, his socks that were not long enough, <laughs> um, but we've now rectified that. Um, and this was him. So as you can see now, we've got more arm swing. This was literally his first steps. He's still a little bit sheepish, but what you can see is we've got heel strike, heel strike, heel strike, heel strike. We'll just play that through, oops. Play that through again. So much more confident. He felt that he could trust his foot, ankle and lower limb. That change in direction is still a little bit challenging, but this was literally the first minute that I, uh, I popped those braces on. And here we are again. This was him when he'd um, had a few trial runs uh, walking up and down the corridor. Again, you can really see that heel strike, a lot more stable. He still has that kind of plonking of the foot. Um, but I'll just play that one more time. Sorry. Ooh. But it's that heel strike, that real uh, meaningful gait cycle that we've now achieved. So I really want to thank Mike um, for putting um, trust in me as a professional um, and he very kindly uh, did a little, uh, well, it's not little actually, it's six minutes long, but I want you to listen uh, to his Richie Brace story. 
Right, uh, good afternoon. My name's Mike Weir, and I want to talk to you about my experience of using the Ritchie brace. Um, I've always been a very active person. Uh, I've done lots of uh, sport, football, tennis, uh, walking, jogging, and I've always tried to keep pretty fit. Um, unfortunately, over the years, I've had a lot, a lot of trouble with um, with low back pain, and I've had two quite serious exacerbations. One when I was in my uh, mid thirties, um, which left me with um, weakness to my left side and numbness down the left side of my leg. Um, it meant that I couldn't play football anymore, but otherwise I was okay. I'd go running. I uh, uh, was, was pretty active. And over time, I just noticed that uh, the foot was a bit weaker. Um, but about 25 years ago, after that first episode, I began playing tennis again without any great difficulty, although my left foot was slightly weaker. Um, about 13 years ago, I had another quite serious bout of back pain, and this, this time the right side was affected and I had those horrible scans where you have to go in those tight things and feel claustrophobic. Uh, but that revealed that there was a disc that was a problem, but it, it resolved. And um, I uh, didn't play tennis for a year, but I used to go walking and it was okay. And then I began playing tennis again. Um, since then, I've had very little back pain, but I've progressively struggled to walk um, in that uh, I couldn't hop on either foot. There was like numbness. I couldn't really feel my feet very well. Um, I couldn't walk as fast as the family, so I I could walk a long way, but it was really very tiring because I was lifting my legs rather than walking from the feet. And um, over the past couple of years, I've really been increasingly disabled. Um, and earlier this year, I had to completely stop playing tennis because I was fearful that my left foot was going to collapse. Um, so I could walk, but it was really very tiring walking. And over the last six months or so, I have really been quite disabled. Walking in the airport to the plane was a problem, climbing the stairs. And uh, we recently went to Madrid and I couldn't walk more than half a mile um, without feeling exhausted. So I, along the way, I did seek help from some physios and from um, uh, podiatrists uh, and that wasn't particularly helpful however through to a bit of good fortune uh, I bumped into a friend's wife who was a podiatrist and she noticed my, my problem and suggested that I have a look at uh, the, the Richie brace and very kindly uh, gave me the address of Zoe Zoe Wright in Kirby Lonsdale. So I duly went along and as you perhaps know um, Zoe is a very effervescent, very kind, enthusiastic soul and we quickly decided that the, the Kirby, uh, the Ritchie brace uh, uh, was, was something I should try. So I took moulds of both feet and then I had to wait, this is about three months ago, I then had to wait for what seemed like forever because uh, I, I had the beginning of optimism that I was going to be much more mobile. So eventually these uh, these things arrived and um, I've put them on and I've worn them now for about six or seven weeks. And my great optimism was actually pessimistic compared to the benefits I've had. I, I am now mobile. Um, I, I always had a sense that my left foot was a problem so I couldn't really stand with people, uh, I had to sit down. So walking was a problem, tennis was ruled out, and, and all, all of that has changed. The, the problem I have at the moment is that I'm very unfit. I've, I've got to learn to walk again from the feet. Um, forgive me, there's an aeroplane overhead, <laughs> uh, instead of stomping along. But the, um, the braces themselves are very comfortable to wear. Uh, initially, there was a, a few problems with uh, um, abrasions to the skin, but um, Zoe very quickly 
sorted that out and that has not been a problem. So they're comfortable to wear. Uh, and I'm now able to put them on very quickly. They fit inside my, my, my hocker shoes. I bought hocker shoes anyway. I was wearing those and I was using walking poles. Um, so they fit very comfortably. I can uh, wear them with shorts, obviously, or I can put trousers over the top and as, though, as I'm going to work. Um, it's meant I can walk now. I can walk, whereas half a mile was a long way. I've recently done five miles. Uh, I'm still slower than I would wish, um, but I've gone from being immobile to active. Um, I've started playing tennis again, um, uh, and it's it's quite it's quite a it's quite a shock to be able to be more more active again. I I love sport and I was quite good at it. Okay, so I asked Mike um, about the brace and. He'd actually seen uh, five podiatrists and four physios. It was something like that. Um, he'd also seen consultants from um, a range of different backgrounds with regards to his foot drop. And he never really got any advice regarding the brace. And his neighbor just so happens to be a podiatrist who I hope is on this evening. And uh, she said, well, I think you should go and see this lady, Zoe. Uh, I think she does this thing called a Ritchie brace and I, I think you should give it a try. Um, and that's kind of how this, this story kind of happened. And Mike, you know, lives a couple of hours away from the clinic and uh, since then has been, um, you know, speaking very highly of that experience. And I've loved, absolutely loved working with him. Um, I hope in some way that we can play this video or we can find out how we can, because it's, uh, you know, to hear it from his perspective is something that we don't always get the opportunity um, for patients to be involved in that process. And, you know, it's a, it's a really important part of, of this for me, for, for all of us treating these patients, what their experiences are of using these braces, because they're not straightforward. They do take time to get used to. They have factors that challenge us as clinicians and challenge patients in terms of how they're used and how they need to be um, kind of incorporated into day-to-day -day life. Um, but these were the two words that I'm gonna leave you with um, that, that Mike, uh, when I rang him a couple of days ago, just to see how he was and, and chat about this webinar, I said, how would you describe it? A very short term, how would you describe it? And he said, transformative. But my favorite part of what he said was freeing. And that is for patients like this who are suffering every day, as soon as they get out of bed, that is just the, the, the absolute, the best word in the world for a clinician to hear. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and I welcome any questions. Okay, Zoe, thank you. Um, there are a few questions that have hopped up here. Um, Liam McManus, McManus is asking the first question. He's saying he has a patient with uh, charcot Marie tooth. The patient has a unilateral Ritchie brace, which has been life changing, but he's a high level adaptive athlete. Just wondering how long the Tamarack hinge would last when patients are challenging the Ritchie brace um, pilometric type exercise, you know? Um, I mean, I can answer that if you wish. <laughs> Um, yeah, Liam, good question, uh, especially with young active patients. Uh, the Tamarack hinge was initially designed primarily to be used with patients, uh, I suppose, post uh, stroke and therefore not that active. And uh, we started using it probably 10 years ago in the military in the UK. And suddenly we had uh, young uh, British um, men and women running half marathons and full marathons in Ritchie braces with Tamarack hinges. So, I mean, the, the first part of the answer is it really depends how much activity the person does. The, the thing to look for is that if you sit the Ritchie brace on a flat table, the upright should be leaning forward. Um, if they're straight and, and parallel to the, the brace or the foot plate itself, then the Tamarack hinge has, has worn out. It won't actually dorsiflex the foot. 
Um, nowadays, all the Ritchie braces or most of them come with pretty strong Tamarack hinges. Um, but still, if you've got a really active person, they'll wear it out. I'm usually telling patients 12 months. Figure on the basis of 12 months, you might have to change the hinges. Um, any other comments on that, Zoe? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really pertinent to talk about the um, different populations that are using the brace. I mean, primarily, you know, lots of my patients that are coming in and are not athletes, the people who want to get out and walk and walk forever and as long as they possibly can in in the best possible health. Um, and I think a lot of these patients do accept, or I hope in to some extent that they accept the restrictions uh, that the condition can place on them. And of course, our role as clinicians is to discuss the expectations, uh, you know, and, and what the expectations are of us as clinicians, but also from our patients. Um, now, Mike is not, um, I don't want to say he's not a high level athlete because he plays tennis to a really good level, you know, good club level. Um, and for him to be able to do that and not to, not to feel like he's going to fall over and to feel confidence in making contact with a tennis ball and moving across the court where required, you know, for him, that that's an absolute win. Um, my experience in elite sport, you know, I don't have as much experience, certainly not with Richie braces anyway. Um, but the Tamarack hinge can fatigue. So I do have a patient who we had the discussion regarding fixed and Tamarack and he opted for Tamarack because he kind of preferred that, that function. But we talked about um, fatiguing and there are actually two different types of Tamarack hinge. Is that right, Martin? There's a the kind of clear material and then the black material and the black is, is kind of more, is a stronger material. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I replace his probably every 18 months to two years, you know, and it, it's not, it's not a, a cheap process for them, but it's all outlined when they come in and that works for him. You know, it really works for him, but we know when it's fatiguing because we can hear him. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, Liam, uh, thanks us for that. And there's another question from Penny Kay, and she's asking, which Hoka do you recommend? So it depends on the patient, but with Mike, um, because he had that kind of cavus foot type, you've got to be really careful of the MLA and the... Um, the bulk of the MLA in the shoe, because obviously if you're trying to achieve, now his brace had valgus post in, in the rear foot. So if you're trying to achieve a more plantar grade position in terms of foot posture, um, then that can be challenging. I use the Gaviota in this case, which is uh, Hoka's most stable shoe. And it's built in with their dynamic stability um, technology, which is a more rigid form of EVA. Great, thanks. Um, another little question here from uh, Phil Robotham, and he's asking, did Mike regain single leg tiptoeing ability? <laughs> no, but obviously, you know, literally Mike's had his braces now, probably about four weeks, but this is a patient who's very involved in his active treatment regimen. And every week for him, he's giving me updates on what he's been able to do. And I think, um, you know, ultimately we never know. Um, but the problem is with that extent of nerve involvement um, and, and the length of time that he's been managing foot drop, um, I don't suspect that he'll regain that. Having said that, when he came for his follow-up about three weeks post brace, um or was it two weeks three weeks or two weeks he said that propulsion was feeling a, a lot easier than, than when it was fitted and everything in his body kind of ached because we were using muscle groups that had never or hadn't been used for a very long period of time so just preparing for those things but I think yeah it's a difficult one because it's the extent of nerve involvement isn't it you know yeah um, lovely little comment here or message from Andrea Hunt, who I'm going to assume is the podiatrist that lived next door to Mike. 
And she says, thank you, Zoe. Uh, so glad you got to see Mike as a patient. I think the Richie Brace has been a game changer. He sent me a few messages singing your praises. So there you go. Um, I think there's a couple of comments to make, Zoe, on this case. The first is the Pez Cavus foot type complicates this when you're looking at foot drop. Foot drop. Um, your first video showed clearly a four foot strike, which is the foot drop. Um, but you could also see that when he got to the end of the, you know, the, the end of the room, he has to take multiple steps to turn because he, he, he has really pays gave his foot type and therefore has the end of it can't pronate through the subtalar joint so he has to take multiple steps mm -hmm. and when you showed me the initial videos we were really debating do we go for a tamarack hinge do we go for fixed hinge and in this case when you see that real pays gave his foot type the fixed hinge probably works better because it controls that frontal plane rotation as well as the sagittal plane foot drop um, and, and we did debate it and uh, it worked really well. So great to see then the follow-up video. The first thing that struck me was how quickly he was moving. Yeah. Um, and also the, the arm movement, as you said, the, his whole confidence had changed. And that was literally on the first few steps. And I do find that with the flaccid foot drops that you see that you put the brace on, you put the shoe on and the person has a heel strike. I mean, it really is one of those moments in a clinical setting that is a wow moment. Um, this was a little bit more difficult because of the Pez Cavus, but you know, the, the flaccid uh, foot drop is, is probably even more wow. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see if there's any other questions. No, that's all at the moment. Uh, is there anything else you would like to comment on, Zoe? I think, you know, I actually wanted to, you know, um, I'm just, you know, I would have loved to have shared this, this story but maybe we'll get another opportunity to do that uh, i think i've kind of echoed all of all of mike's thoughts on the process um i think it's really important with these cases to really brush up on our neurological anatomy and our assessment of of neurological um symptoms and i actually had a patient who came in with positive neurological symptoms um and she was uh, red flagged through the neurology system and this was a patient who actually you know her, she felt that she kept going back and forth you know to the GP with certain symptoms that things just weren't right um, and in the end she was diagnosed with a tumor on her spine and um, had that tumor not been diagnosed she would have had paralysis from the neck down and I received this email last week and it just really made me um, tune into what ability we have as clinicians to identify things. And, you know, if that sixth sense is telling you that something's not right, it probably isn't. Um, and, and I would always just say um, to proceed with caution and ensure that you've done a, a thorough his medical history um, and you understand the patient's reasons for developing the foot drop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you did share that email with me and it is one of those cases that you, you knew there was a red flag, you referred on and uh, like, wow, you, you, you've made the big impact in this patient's life. And, um, you know, that could be, uh, in this case, a tumor, but it could be a neurological condition like Charcot Marie Tooth. It could be motor neuron disease, could be tarsal coalition. You know, there's it, a whole range mm -hmm. of things that mm -hmm. that we as podiatrists can get involved in. So, um, yeah, incredible stuff. And uh, I think maybe let me see. Is there another couple of questions have come in, Zoe? Um, yeah. Liam's asking, patient with the tibialis posterior, full thickness rupture, full tendon rupture, does not want surgery. This has been like, has been like this for four years. Stiff pes planus, although not fixed, poor ankle joint dorsiflexion, cannot achieve um, 90 degree ankle joint. Would you go for fixed hinge or tamarack? Not a tamarack, uh, not a foot drop. No. No, um, I mean, um, I would say in this case, it's a standard hinge, Liam. 
you know, um, and because you can't get to 90 degrees, you may well have to put a heel lift on um, to compensate for that. Um, so I'm thinking standard hinge to promote ankle joint dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, um, heel lift. Um, yeah, I, I would. I probably would a tend medial, to say medial Kirby sky, four, six millimeters. That's it. Balance everything to vertical. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd certainly say the heel raise 100%. And again, like you said, a standard hinge because, you know, a tamarack hinge isn't going to work because they can't get to 90. And even if you did use it, it would fatigue. I think that the, the standard hinge is going to give the patient some stability, but it's also not going to restrict movement that they currently have, which may proceed to producing more pain symptoms. Well, this is your classic adult acquired flat foot rather than a drop foot. So, yes, yeah, standard hinge, he lift four to six millimeter um, medial uh, curvy sky. Um, Penny's asking, what are the earliest subtle clinical signs of? drop foot paresthesia so symptoms of numbness they may have dermatomes um regarding the the sciatic nerve root perineal nerve roots which are already showing signs of um nerve or sensory deficit so i think it starts with that it might not even um produce any neural symptoms it could just be lower back pain um, and it could be a progressive weakness of dorsiflexion and that dorsiflexion uh, may well become worse when that patient is fatigued. Um, so, you know, I would say it's the forefoot strike, that inability to dorsiflex the foot and uh, any of yeah, them I, yeah, just suggested. Yeah. So that's what you see. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Weakness, yeah. and and then obviously what they what they tell you and what what you know the things like paresthesia and. Yeah, I think I, I mean just it's a, it's an obvious comment to make here is that it does change the scope of our practice, you know, and 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 you've you've seen that Zoe and um, um, mm -hmm. thankfully you young pods are very good on Instagram and other social media channel channels that you can get out there and you know people know that you do this now and indeed you ran a course in the Lake District and have influenced other pods to start prescribing Richie Brace yeah. and you've now influenced their clinical practice and you've also reached their patient base to help them so yeah. I mean that, that's a that's a high level of enthusiasm you know I was thinking, hang on, we're Firefly the Lab. We're the pair of people who should be running these courses. But of course, we did support you, you know. Um, yeah, 100%. Like, I think it's like you guys have been the reason that I'm where I'm at in terms of what I'm doing and how I've pushed my clinical expertise, my confidence, and then my ability to help other clinicians. And, you know, I'm just giving it to you from a, a clinician's perspective. And, you know, what I find works for, for people and patients. Um, but we're very lucky to have you guys as a support network. And we're very lucky to have people like Doug Ritchie on this earth, you know, because yeah. the guy's a genius, an absolute genius. And I hope he's listening or at least he'll listen back. Um, yeah. But what he's done for thousands of people across the globe with this device is just you know it's amazing and I think for the profession this is a really exciting uh, venture if this is something that you are doing or plan to do. Okay listen we're we're coming up on the R so I think we'll basically say a huge thank you to Zoe um, thank you for your enthusiasm your passion your uh, desire to share which is immense Please, a big thanks to, to Mike for, you know, allowing all that to be shared with us. OK, folks, have a great evening. Uh, thanks, Connor. Thanks, uh, Zoe. And uh, take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, guys.